Thanks. All right. So uh, this is being recorded. So we're starting out. I guess there are about 38 people or so, which means that there should be 30-ish when we all when, when when everything settles down. Okay. Uh, I wanted to start by giving you like a brief introduction to what the course is about. A brief introduction to sort of how I'm approaching the course, sort of where I come from, and then uh, also how the course can be set up. Some administrative details, and then I'll end. Well, actually, after that, I'll kind of go st straight into the first topic, which is optimization. So we'll actually have some math today. You know, you can't do a course on math without math, so we'll start with the math today. Um, so uh, I, I should start by saying that this is a course that's a bit unusual in many respects. The first one is I'm not an expert on any of these topics. I am not an expert in optimization. I'm not an expert in probability or queuing theory or any of these things. However, I have tried my best to study and learn it. Uh, I didn't ever have a course on optimization or for that matter queuing theory, and I'm going to try and teach it to you. So the approach I'm taking is that not that of an expert in queuing theory telling you about queuing theory. It's, an expo uh, it's the approach of somebody who has a different background, which is computer networking, and saying, you know what, these are the areas of expertise I wish I had when I started studying this. I wish somebody taught me probability or uh, queuing theory or optimization. And so I've taught it to myself, and now I'm trying to pass it on to you. Okay, so it's in, in the nature of an explorer who kind of goes into uh, a new unexplored continent and reports on the activities of the various tribes. You know, here are some tribes that daub themselves in red ochre and, you know, dance about naked in the flight of the full moon. Okay, and that's it. He's not an anthropologist, or an exp he doesn't know these tribes. Okay, so I, I, I'm not an expert in any of these areas, but I'm going to try my best to know more than you. Okay. However, some of you could be experts. You may have advanced degrees or whatever, or advanced knowledge in some areas, or maybe all of them. Uh, and so please feel free to correct me, because I am not speaking to you from the position of I know everything about it. I'm speaking from the position of this is stuff I wish I'd known. I'm going to pass it on to you, and all corrections are, are very welcome. And so that's, uh, I just want to give you that, that mindset. Just to give you some background, I, some of the, we'll be studying six topics over here, uh, optimization, probability, queuing theory, uh, control theory, game theory, and statistics, uh, and not exactly in that order. And uh, all of these are things I sort of picked up after my PhD, which I got before many of you were born. No, just kidding. <laughs> Uh, that's, you know, I got a PhD in 91, and many of these things were not there. So I studied as part of my thesis, I studied game theory and control theory. And of course, you do probability and statistics as an undergrad, uh, or I assume you do probability and statistics as an undergrad. But some of these things don't really show up. We end up reading papers at different conferences that refer to control theory or referred to queuing theory or referred to control, uh, game theory, and you're expected to know it, but how are you supposed to know it? You know, you don't want to do a full course in that. So uh, what this is supposed to be is like to give you just enough background so that you can understand or appreciate intuitively what's going on. So what this course really is, is a series of tutorials, a series of six tutorials. Each tutorial is sort of four lectures, and it gives you enough so that you have a, some understanding of what's going on, okay? And uh, again, this comes from the fact that this is what I had to teach myself in order to, to read or review these papers, okay, for these different conferences. So uh, that's what's going on here. Uh, the uh, analogy I like to use is what I call a tourist guide. So let's say you go to Paris and you come out of the subway and this big metal structure is in front of you. And you look at it, and you don't know what it is. Well, what is this big metal structure? And you open up your guidebook, it says, oh, there's something called the Eiffel Tower. You know, it was built 100 years ago. And gives you some description of what it is. So at least you know what the Eiffel Tower is. However, you don't learn how to speak French, OK? This course will not teach you how to speak French. It will tell you that's the Eiffel Tower. So you don't look like, so you're not a complete idiot when you go there, OK? So this you can think of as remedial guide to complete idiocy in optimization and queuing theory, <laughs> uh, if you wish. However, I don't want to sacrifice mathematical rigor. So the approach I want to take is to explain the same idea three different ways. First is sort of uh, intuitively, and the second thing is mathematically, where the mathematical formalisms are all correct, and the third was through an example. So there's going to be a lot of examples, and everything's going to be explained with examples. 
So that sort of gives you roughly the flavor of the course. Um, let's see, are there any questions about any of this? No, okay. All right, so the second thing I wanted to go through was some of the sort of administrative uh, details. Um, so, you know, the ta class time has been changed. It uh, was supposed to be 9.30, but uh, as I mentioned, 9.30, uh, we would have been in that room, and this is a bigger, nicer room. Plus, uh, there was a conflict with some other course, so it looks like this is nailed down. So the class time will be 11.30. Uh, I didn't know how much time to expect, so I asked for two hours in case I run over. But most of the time, I expect it to be about an hour and a half, and if there are a lot of questions, so whatever, we might go over maybe 10, 15 minutes. It would be good for you to budget two hours, and then if you have less, then you think you gain some time, rather than budgeting one and a half hours, and then you know being angry at me at going over. So expect this to be a two hour minus minus, uh, then one hour, one and a half hours plus plus, okay, and then you'll be fine. So, but it's, it's, it's roughly, it's one and a half hours, but I might run over. Uh, there's going to be 24 lectures starting with this one, so uh, as far as I can make out, there are no holidays falling in any of the lecture times, so no luck for you. And uh, it'll be tw Tuesday, Thursday, 11.30 to 1ish, uh, so that's twice a week. Uh, I am teaching from a draft of a book that I'm writing, and the book is uh, actually a revision of a book I wrote uh, 12 years ago. And so I'm adding sort of six appendices, and these six appendices actually constitute this course. The Mathematical Foundations is, is part three of the book that will come out sometime next year. So what I'm doing is uh, uh, I'm actually putting all the material online, the PDFs. You can, if you go to my, if you just Google my name on, uh, I have the fortunate position of being the first hit on Google. So you just type that into Google or your favorite search engine, and it will pop up as the first hit. Click on it, and the news, the first item in the news as of today is I'm teaching this course. Click on the name of the course. It puts you into the course outline, as well as the PDFs for the first two uh, sections, which are the ones which I've revised enough to be uh, e enough to show you. And uh, you can just download it and you know look at it and so on. And it, it, it's it's a draft, but in reasonably good shape. And I noticed some of you actually printed it out, so you know that it's in reasonably good shape. It sort of looks like a book, even though I, uh, even though it's not yet published. Uh, let's see. And then uh, well, I'm going to use that same page, that same uh, link from my website to be the course web page as well. There are many other things that you can use for websites as ACE and various other things. Uh, this is a wiki that I run and manage. It's easy for me, and I don't see any reason to change anything. So if you just Google my name, you'll find a link on that page to uh, either in the news section, actually it'll migrate in a few months, perhaps a few weeks, uh, to the uh, left bar under courses. There's a link called courses, and you can look in the current course, and there'll be a link to this. So it'll always, you can always find it from my home page, and that shouldn't be too hard to do. Uh, Okay, any questions about any of this stuff here? Yes? I'm coming to that, I'm coming to that. Yeah. You'll, you'll hear it in gruesome detail. This is just questions of what I said so far. Okay, so uh, let me see, there's a couple more things administratively and then I'll go into the marks and, and a few other things. So one thing I'd like to do, one thing I like to do is to know the names of all the students in the class and uh, I actually recognize some students here who took my uh, grad course in 2004 fall, and that's so. You guys, it's about time you you know left. I think, <laughs> but actually, it's good to see people and I know their names. And in fact, these are students who you begin to see over and over again, and you kind of uh, uh, over the course of the years. And I expect to see many of you again. So I'd like to do that. So what I'd like you to do is that when you ask me a question, give me tell me your name, and then you know. This way, hopefully, I'll do it. The other thing I'm going to do, and you're not going to like this, but it helps me, is I do a roll call at the beginning of class. I actually call out your names, and you raise your hand if you're there or you're not there. What happens is that I found that within about three or four lectures, I can actually learn the names of everybody by just going over them repeatedly. And uh, last time I taught, I had about 95 students in my class, and I had all of them down in about six or, eight, six or seven lectures, which was pretty good. 
I've forgotten most of the names by now, but at that time it felt pretty good. I'm going to continue to try doing that. So the roll call is not for any marks or evaluation or anything. It's just for me to learn your names, okay? And what I'll do is I'll call out your names and then after a while I should be able to just look around and see your name and just kind of check you off. And if I call your name into the future, either you're not attending classes <laughs> or for some reason I'm confusing you and you know, that's because I'm growing old. So either way, it's my fault or your fault, <laughs> one of the two, <laughs> but we'll figure it out. So anyway, for now, just if you ask me a question, you know, ask me, to give me your name and that'll be fine. Unless I know you already, <laughs> which is okay. All right, so Max. Uh, I, uh, so the course naturally falls into six sections, so it makes sense to have six somethings in place. So what is six somethings? There are three choices, six exams, <laughs> six homework assignments, or six exams and homework assignments, okay? <laughs> it's all the choices, it's very simple. So let me tell you, that I say I asked some of my students, I said, do you want exams? They all said, no, no, no way, no how exams. I said, why not? We'll have to study. I said, that sounds like a good idea to me. I said, we'll have to study stuff that we don't know whether it's going to be in the exam or not. We'll study all the material, even though it's not going to be tested. I said, that's fantastic. That's great. You have to study all the material, even the stuff I don't ask you. That's great. You know, what's it will be stressful. We'll have to devote time to this course. So that's great. You'll have, you'll watch less YouTube, but that's okay by me. <laughs> so the more this guy told me about why he doesn't want to do an exam, the more I realized this is fantastic. I said, who had invented exams is a smart guy. You had to get the students to commit to a certain amount of time of reviewing the material and reading the stuff and actually doing some work. I mean, what a concept. Uh, and so, uh, I'd like to get now your feedback as to why you don't want exams because everybody said no, all right? Who has the guts to tell me why they don't want an exam? <laughs> yes, so the exam, uh, I'm planning to, if I do an exam, it'll be essentially multiple choice of you know, things like that. It's to test your uh, grasp of sort of the major concepts, it's not going to say define X, you know, that's stupid, right? The goal is to just make sure you've reviewed the material at at one level of just sort of reading through it. You have kind of one level more understanding. So yes, you have, it, 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 um, yeah, you have to trust me that it's not going to be, uh, it's not an exam for the sake of, uh, uh, you know, catching you off on something you don't know. It's okay, so it's good testing the regular material, I guess. Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm leaning towards homeworks and assignments, because <laughs> so exams and assignments, because the, the exam tests you sort of on the on the breadth, and then you can go back and try a few examples. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm prepared to be convinced uh, otherwise, but this is just my, my my thinking about it. So any you know, we can discuss this. I'm happy to have any other comments. Yes. So. For me, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Not as much work as writing a book. <laughs> and all the exams and assignments go into the exercises at the back of the book anyway, so I have to do it. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, are we going to use the lecture time for the exam? What, what's your name again? Uh, Wai Ning. Wai Ning. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so like, yeah, I was thinking of having in, in class sort of the half hour, so the Tuesday class, so every two weeks, the half, first half hour of the Tuesday class would actually be an in-class exam, which would be, you know, like, a, so you'll have the weekend to study for it. Yeah, that would be but the... Like, I mean, if we have take-home uh, assignments, and then we have both, like, one, one hour and a half for a lecture. So if, yes. if we have six exams, yes. we yes. have less time for it. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's very thoughtful of you also. But that's okay, I'll manage. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just take, you know, that's why I budgeted two hours instead of one and a half hours. So I, I took that into account. Uh, by the way, I, I, I never liked exams either when I was a student, you know. But on the other hand, as I said, my memory is failing, so all those things have been put behind. <laughs> so, uh, so here is what I'm going to suggest. Let's 
go with the exam for the first one, right? The optimization thing, which will be two weeks from today, and you know, it's a half hour thing. You'll get some idea what it is. If you still think it's a terrible idea, fine, you know, we'll we'll scrap it. But I want to at least give you one. Let's give it one shot at it, and uh, you know, you'll see what it's like. And I don't think it's going to be particularly hard. If you're paying attention in class, you're re reading through the material, following the exams, uh, examples, and you know, going through it. I don't think it's going to be you know, super hard or anything like that. So that answers your question on how you can be evaluated. <laughs> okay, and in terms of assignments, uh, I am actually planning to give out to homework assignments, um, and uh, we'll, we'll, do bo we'll do that as well. And, uh, you know, well, yeah, which actually, let me, let me just, pause. so there will be an assignment and there will be an exam, and now I'm going to actually jump right into the, my, my policy on grading. My policy on grading is very simple. I don't care, okay? I just don't give a damn about grading, and it's on video, and it's true. Uh, the last time I taught a course, what I told people was to email me the grade they wanted on the week of the, on the final week. They said, I want 95, I gave them 95. You know, they want 98. Nobody asked me for 100, but if somebody asked me 100, I'd give them 100. Why? Why do I not give a damn? Because it is completely an irrelevant number, okay? It's a completely irrelevant number. You're all in grad school. When you graduate, either you have master's or you have PhD, okay? If you have a PhD and somebody asks you what marks you got in the Mathematical Foundations course, you didn't do a right PhD. Already you're sunk, okay? Already your whole life is ruined. You're going to be in this complete tragedy of a life, and so a low mark isn't going to hurt you. Okay, if you did a great PhD and you got a low mark in this course, nobody cares. You wrote this brilliant paper that's cited by 2,000 people already, and you got a low mark in this course. Ah, you had a bad semester, who cares? Okay, either way, it doesn't matter with the PhD. With the master's, similarly, everything depends on sort of your, your letters of recommendation, you know, what, how you did in your interview, and so on and so forth. Marks doesn't really matter at all. The only thing that mark matters is you have to get something above 80 to get a scholarship or something like that. Every professor in grad school gives you 80 anyway, just for being alive. You know, you show up on the last day. <laughs> yeah, 80. Sounds like 80 to me. So given this, the only motivation for you to do this course is because you want to learn something. That's all there is to it. The only motivation is for you to learn something. And the exams and the homework assignments are purely a way for you to kind of, you know, gauge whether you're understanding the material or not, right? And so, yes, you know, there will be exams and assignments, but uh, it's for yourself, it's not for me, okay? I actually know this material, you don't, okay? That's the relationship over here. So if you want to uh, learn this, then spend the time on it. If you don't want to, don't, you won't learn it. It's not a big deal, you know, I have tenure. <laughs> <laughs> so on this happy note, uh, the grading for this course is sort of kind of based on exams, but in the end, you know, I'm actually open to just having you send me emails saying, I want such a mark, I just put it in. And the funny thing is nobody asks me why. You know, I don't have to go to the head of the department and they say, so many for this and this. They say, what is the marks distribution? I said, this is it. Say, okay, fine, next. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, complete uh, and completely uh, irrelevant to the whole structure of the course, and therefore I plan to have uh, uh, essentially self-evaluation, okay? So uh, there'll be homework assignments and et cetera, et cetera, but uh, in the end, you know, just email me what mark you want, <laughs> okay? And, and that brings me to the next thing, which I call the law of karmic grading, or the law of karma applied to grading. So what's the law of karma? It basically says, if you do something good in this life, next life you'll be better. If you do something bad, you'll be reborn as a cockroach, okay? Assuming the cockroach is the worst, the lowest, or it could be a slime mold or something also for that matter. But slime molds also have good properties, so I won't go there. What it applies here is the following. If you, do poor, if you don't study for the course, you won't learn. If you won't learn, it's going to hurt you later on in life. That's it. Okay. So uh, you may, I'm going to teach you optimization. You don't study it. You know, 20 years from now, you, you're going to write this groundbreaking paper, but you screwed up in the optimization. <laughs> it's your fault. And you will reap the benefits uh, or not of your actions yourself. You know, basically, it doesn't hurt me. Okay, or it hurts you the most. So I believe each of you, as being in grad school, has recognizing this essential truth. So, you know, 
that's why all these marks and all these things doesn't really matter. So you, when you leave undergrad school, you're all revved up. You know, you've been four years, people have been pounding into your head, marks, you know, marks and more marks. You're all Marxists, okay? <laughs> Just relax, forget about it. You're in grad school now, Marx doesn't matter, it's a capitalist society. Just relax, okay? I'm sorry, I'm, my, my lectures are full of bad puns, okay? <laughs> this, this, I can't control it. Or rather, I can control it, but don't want to. <laughs> so, uh, forget about Marx, focus on learning, enjoy the material. It can be a lot of fun. It's dry math, but it's a lot of fun. You know, there's some really elegant beauty to it. Appreciate it, and you know, just do it because you like doing it, okay? And, okay, so I'm going to pause here for a minute, and you know, any questions about this? So I know Nabil, you were in the class. Kamran, you were, you were there too? So if you, yeah. So that's what happened, right? You guys send me email. <laughs> so when I told them that four years ago, send me email with whatever mark you want, you should have seen the look on their face. What? The whole superstructure of self-identity and doing well in class and getting high marks collapses <laughs> in front of your eyes. Like, oh, it was pretty useless all, after all this time. Unfortunately, true. <laughs> it is useless. All that Marx got you was into grad school. Now Marx don't matter. So anyway. All right. So I'll pause with that lecture and stop. Any questions about this at all? OK. Let me move on. Um, I want to talk about sort of the structure of instruction in the class. And then I'll talk about sort of a, the philosophy of learning. So structure of instruction. So when I was in grad school, Long time ago, my instructor drew this graph. And on the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is sort of uh, attention, I guess. By the way, can you read this in the back? Is this visible? Yeah. So it sort of looks like this. Uh, there's a knee in the curve at about 20 minutes. <laughs> it gets better. So let's say this is the end. There's a dotted line over here. There's sort of a peak over here. So, and this is at about uh, 10 minutes. All right. So what's happening? You start, you know, you come into class, you know, you whatever, you just came in. And about 20 minutes, for the first 20 minutes, you're paying attention. After 20 minutes, I could be, you know, doing hula hoops over here. It doesn't matter. Your brain is getting full. Okay. So, so what you need to do is to basically stop talking over here and do something funny or different, and then you get another 20 minutes like so, at 20 minutes. So what we'll do is I'll start the class essentially exactly on time at 11.30, and I'll talk for about 20 minutes or until the first person starts to sleep, okay? When that happens, we'll take a five-minute break and do whatever administrative stuff has to be done. If no administrative stuff is to be done, I don't know, we can do something uh, in that five minutes or so. And just to get you back to this attention level here, and then we'll glide down that again for another 20 minutes or so. And then there's another break over here. And then you get this nice bump, which is 10 minutes before the end, you know that it's going to end. So suddenly you start waking up and say, okay, <laughs> time for lunch, you know, time for whatever is going on. So, so basically this leads to a structure of 20 plus 5, and then 20, and then 5. And the last one is 30 because you kind of go down, and then just when you're at the bottom, you perk up, knowing that the you know the whole thing is going to end pretty soon. So so that's what I'm going to do. So I'll, I'll teach over 20 minutes, a five-minute break, 20 minutes, about five-minute break, about 30 minutes. The whole thing adds up to one hour and 20 minutes if you do the math, which is the typical class period at Waterloo because you're going to the next class. We might run over a little bit, and we might run over a little bit. So the whole thing will be one hour and hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes, depending on how things are going. But I hope that once the first person starts sleeping, it stop. It also means, please show up on time. This is a hard start time at whatever, 11.30. And so I'll start right away. And I'm not doing any administrative stuff in the beginning. But I'll move that until the until this part over here. OK. So any questions? For, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, what's your name? Oh, Way. Okay, who has to leave? Who has a class at one o'clock? You and you, you, two of you have one o'clock classes. Okay, 
So, are you planning to take this class? <laughs> You're just sitting, okay, then you can just leave, okay, that's no problem. How about you? Yeah, I'm to Okay, so I'll try and make sure that, you know, we do finish one and a half hours or at least there's nothing happening after one and a half hours, but uh, yeah, okay. All right, so the two of you, okay, thanks. Um, let's see, that was the first thing I wanted to say. Yeah, actually that was my thing, okay. Uh, all right, any other questions about this at all? Yes. Do you have office hours? By, it just send me email. Okay. Yeah. Email. It's, uh, I used to have office hours and then I realized nobody came. <laughs> For about 12 years I had office hours and nobody came. <laughs> and then I just got fed up with the whole thing and I said, just send me email. And nobody sends me email either, by the way. <laughs> so at least now I've gained time that nobody's going to come to. Uh, all right. Any other questions at all? Okay. I'm going to now do an IQ test. <laughs> All right, so there's a very simple IQ test. Okay, so so what is this figure? <laughs> Anybody want to tell me what if this figure is? Okay, Ali, what's this figure? It's a triangle. Why is it a triangle? It has three sides. What's a side? So a straight line, I guess, right? Is this a straight line? It's not a straight line. I mean, it's really pretty crooked, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's not, is this a straight line? No, it's not. It's not because at the microscopic level, it's bits of chalk, mm -hmm. and they're kind of all over the place. If I magnify it, it looks something like this. It's not a straight line, and this is not a straight line either. So I had three non-straight lines. So it's not a triangle. So you failed the test, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but all of you said it's a triangle when you looked at it. All of you said it, right? So all of you failed. Why did you fail? Why did you think it's a triangle? When obviously it's not a triangle. I mean, if I show you, if I tell you now, is it a triangle? All of you will say, of course it's not a triangle, right? You now know that it's not a triangle. So what happened? Why did you think it was a triangle in the beginning? Anybody want to try and answer? Yes. Yes, exactly. So what you've done is, in your mind, you have a mental image of a triangle. You have a kind of a triangle ideal, right, which has sides. And in fact, and in fact, no real triangle looks like a triangle. In fact, no real triangle because of quantum imperfections or whatever, or molecular structure is actually going to have straight lines. So in fact, what you've done is, you've taken the best fit ideal shape in your mind and mapped it onto what I've drawn on the board, right? And what I've drawn on the board is this thing over here, and you say, yep, that's a triangle, you got it, right? Right away, you didn't think about it, and only when I point out to you it's not a triangle, you realize it's not a triangle, okay? So, so what's going on? What's going on is the following, and this is actually due to Socrates. I stole this straight out of Socrates. It's in Plato's book five of the Republic, if you care to look it up. Because Socrates drew a line on the sand and asked the nobleman, what is it? He said, triangle. He says, you fail. <laughs> yeah? You fail because it's not a triangle. What's really going on this is really fundamental, and it actually means something in respect to teaching, which is why I bring it up in the first class, is that I didn't put that ideal triangle in your head, right? I didn't put it in your head, neither anybody else. You put it in your head, <laughs> okay? The symbolic representation of a triangle exists in your head because you put it in. And how did you do it? You did it because you did it through induction. You know, people showed you this and said so it's a triangle, that's a triangle, that's a triangle, whatever, you know, all of these things are triangles. You say, aha, uh, this must be a straight line, sort of whatever that is, and this must be a triangle, and you got that into your head, and it comes through effort. You can't just get it, you have to study it, and you often, you often have this when you're studying. You look at this concept, you read it, you read something, it doesn't click, and then something click. What's that click? It's the creation of a mental concept inside your head. And when you have that mental concept inside your head, then you actually understand what's going on. And the only way to get there is by doing it, you know, by studying, all right? So I can talk till I'm blue in the face saying triangle, 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 but until you put the effort in, it is not going to go inside your head, all right? And all this is a very long way of saying, I can talk all I want about optimization or queuing theory or whatever, but until you make that effort, 
of understanding, of creating those mental concepts, you actually have learned nothing, okay? Because two years from now, something else will pop up, and you won't say triangle, you'll just say, oh, three jagged lines, <laughs> okay? Because that's what you see. So what education is about at a fundamental level is to allow you to create these mental concepts inside your brain, and only you can do it. I can't do it, okay? So I'm going to help you. I'm going to tell you about triangles in 10 different ways, but at the end of it, that effort has to come from you, okay? And I'm just saying that in some sense, you're sort of partners in creating mental concepts. I'm trying to give you the intuitions, and you have to work at it by reading the text, by following the examples, coming up with your own thinking, and if you do that, it will actually get into your brain, okay? And that's the only way it's gonna happen, okay? All right, go ahead and try this on all your friends. You'll be surprised how few of them will say, that's not a triangle. <laughs> <laughs> so, bad party trick. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, uh, let's see. So, I think I've done everything that I wanted to do uh, with this over here. And, all right. So, let's take a, like a shortish break and then, uh, you know, kind of recharge your mental muscles and then we'll start in about, you know, three or four minutes and we'll start with the sectional optimization. And you know, if there any questions, you can ask me or you can ask your friends over there. Any questions about any of the stuff so far or? Okay. So, uh, by the way, this, this first part was sort of the comedy section of the course. <laughs> After that, it's all tragedy, you know. <laughs> so, I, 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 so, I remember some, some student came to me, come some back, says, your first lecture was so much fun and after that it was all very dry. <laughs> well, that's the nature of the beast, anyway. So, uh, just I want to add a couple of quick things. So, how many of you are from CS, are CS grad students over here? Okay, maybe I should invert it. How many of you are not CS grad students? Okay, one, two, okay. And uh, uh, how many of you are PhD students here? Okay, and masters? Okay, all right. Good, okay. So, I'm gonna dive right into the uh, first topic, which is optimization. So, <clears throat> optimization, generally speaking, uh, means that we have some kind of system and we are trying to make it better. We're trying to find uh, a way to choose parameters or choose something so it's the best possible, it's optimal in that sense, right? That's the whole point. And it shows up in all sorts of different places, many, many different places. And in fact, it is so important that we actually have a department here in Combinatorics and Optimization which is devoted part of it at least, to optimization. 
So as you can imagine, it's a very, very complex and very large field. And what I'm talking about here is really just the kind of the high level points, a Mickey Mouse introduction or tourist guide. Uh, you really can spend entire career or entire careers studying optimization. So what I have over here is just a very, very limited view into that. But the goal, nevertheless, is to give you some sense of what it's all about, what you're trying to do. Okay, and hopefully at the end of you know next Thursday sort of, or uh, in about two weeks, you have some grasp of what does it take to optimize the system, what's really going on. Uh, before we can optimize any system, the first thing we need to do is to model it. Okay, we need to we need to kind of put it down in the form of a mathematical model. Okay, and what that means is that we need to take the system and kind of attach some some parameters, something that. Can you, that we can use math on. And this is the part which actually is the hardest part. This is the part that there is, there is no, there's no, no way to teach it other than to try it yourself a few different ways because there, there is, it, it, uh, the same system can be modeled in very many different ways, okay? Just to take that simple example, you know, we, I, I said there's a triangle, that's one way of modeling it. You know, I can say, oh no, that's actually a bunch of chalk. You know, I can look at the distribution of chalk or I can look at you know some irregularities. I can focus on that. I can focus on visual perception. Whatever. I mean, there are a hundred different ways of doing it. So how you choose the model is is the, is the least is 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 is, is, a, is the part that only comes from experience. So there is no actual way to do it. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to tell you what are the working parts of a model. Somebody says, here's a system. Here's something. You know. Then you say, okay, I have to build a model for it. So what do you look for, okay? So what you look for are basically uh, five things. So the first thing is what are called the fixed parameters. A fixed parameter as it states is the constants. In a, in a, if, you write a, if you write a program, you know, there's some constants. Some things that you cannot change. It's given to you somehow, and you don't know how it came there, but that's the way it is. So those are the fixed parameters. So when you look at a system, you kind of look at it and say, okay, what are the things that I know for sure are going to be true? What are the things that are given to me, not, also, not in my control? And those are called the fixed parameters. The second thing are what I call the control parameters. The control parameters are the knobs. These are the things you can change, okay? so. For example, you may you know you're driving a car. The fixed parameter is you know the 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 size of the car perhaps, or how much uh, gas you can put in the tank. Okay, that's a fixed parameter. You can't really change that. Now, how how much you press the accelerator or how, how you change the steering wheel, those are control parameters. You can actually do that. So you can turn the steering wheel, you can press the accelerator, you can press the brake. Those are the control parameters, and you have some some control over that. The other thing we have, what I call input parameters. Now, input parameters don't show up so much in optimization, but they show up in control theory. So I'm putting it in just now, just for just for completeness sake. And input parameters are things that you cannot control, but they're not fixed either. Okay, they're kind of so you're driving the car, and you want to uh, control that you want to optimize how much you know petrol, how much gas you use, right? How far you press the accelerator. The input parameter could be the wind. Okay, the wind kind of changes direction, sometimes against you, sometimes it's behind you. And perhaps you're trying to do a cruise control system that maintains a steady pace, so let's say 70 kilometers an hour. And so the input is the uncontrolled extraneous input. Okay, it's uncontrolled. If it were controlled, I would do it over here. That could be the wind that's, 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 that's coming in. And then we have the output parameters. And what's the output parameters? These are the output of the system. This is the metric. You know, for example, when I said you want to maintain your speed at 70 kilometers an hour, the output could be the absolute difference between the actual speed and the what speed that you want to maintain. So let's say the speed you want to maintain is this, and the actual speed is something like that. Perhaps the area under this curve over here is the output parameter. Okay, that's one output parameter. You could also measure the amount of petrol that you use. That would be another output parameter. So these are quantitative ways of measuring the output of the system. Okay, and finally we have something called the transfer function. And the transfer function 
is again at some level the hardest part, okay? It tells you how the system translates from the control and the input and the fix to the output, okay? So it says, given all this, how do I get that? For example, again taking the car as an example, I have a certain uh, velocity at this particular point in time. I have a particular uh, fixed parameter, maybe the, the size of the gas line that connects the fuel tank to the engine, the capacity of the engine, all these are fixed parameters. The control parameter could just be how far down you press the accelerator, right? The input is the wind, so that, you know that's some kind of input, uh, wind is coming towards you or against you, something like that. The output could be your output velocity, okay? So transfer function says, how does the output velocity depend upon the, the size of the gas tank and the engine type, how far around you press the accelerator, and which way the wind is blowing? So just to kind of, here is the car. Let's say the wind is blowing in this direction, and I have some kind of engine over here, E, and I have the accelerator, you know, in some position. Let's say this gap is X over there is how far above the base is X. So basically I'm saying the output velocity V is some function of the accelerator position, the wind velocity, okay, and the sort of the uh, engine, okay. So this F over here, it maps from the accelerator position, the wind and the engine size is the transfer function, okay. What does this function look like? Could be anything, all right? It could be anything at all. And one way of doing things would be you could you could measure it. You could you could take the car on the road and you could put the accelerator, you know, four, four centimeters above the base, you know, keep the wind constant, keep the engine constant, see what the output is and kind of measure it out and then you get one transfer function. Then you say, okay, I'm going to take a fan and blow it on the car so I control the wind velocity, keep it fixed and so on. And I can then elicit, I can extract the transfer function F in this fashion empirically. Or the transfer function may be given to you because of some in implicit, uh, some inherent mathematical constraints. You know, it may just be that we know this is a good modeling uh, of the system or, uh, but, but you know, this is sort of something you don't really uh, have any uh, control over either, but, and that's a transfer function over here. So a lot of things depends on what the transfer function looks like. Okay, so what we're going to do now, and we're trying to get a little bit more into this, is that the control variables have essentially what I call feasible, a feasibility constraint. Going back to the accelerator of the car, well, you know, the, the pedal has to be no more, you know, if this is the, if this is the pedal, so this is the front of the car and that's the, that's the pedal. How does it even look like? Okay, I guess it looks something like that. And so let's call this to be X. We know that X has to be at least zero, right? It's greater than or equal to zero. And maybe the maximum value of this is some value max. So we can say zero is less than or equal to X, less than or equal to max. Right? And that max is sort of the full extension. When you're not pressing down on the gas at all, you have completely relaxed. That's the that's how much you have. That's max. So this control variable lies in this range, zero and max. Okay? And zero means you are you know going at full power and max means you're going at zero velocity, but that's okay. So this is the feasibility constraint that feeds into the transfer function over here. So already we're beginning to make progress in modeling the system, right? We can say, okay, we're going to find, uh, we, can, we, can, we can say that X lies in this range over here. The next thing we want to do is we want to have essentially an objective function, okay? The objective function It's a function of the of the output variables. Okay. What are you trying to do? We're trying to uh, model sort of the performance of the system. So, what's the performance of the system? Maybe the performance of the system is this gap over here, okay, so let's just, so this, maybe I'll draw this better over here. So let's say the first, the first criterion I have, first output is this, I have time on this axis, I have the 
required velocity and then have the actual velocity like this. And I'll take the, and let's say I'll just take some fixed time interval just to get time out of the picture. So let's say I define this time period as t. And then I take the total area under the curve. And let's call that area under the curve a over here. All right. And also I look at, in the same thing, I look at how much uh, gas is being used. Okay, so over time, the gas, the gas that's being used is going to be some monotone function. So let's say it looks like that. So I can look at this over here. Let's call that G as the gas that's being used. So I have two of output variables, A and G. All right. So what I can define as the objective function, typically written as crypto, is let's say it's just A plus alpha g, all right? So I want to, uh, you know, basically, if A is large, my system is not doing too well. It's not really keeping the set point. I want the set point to be 70 kilometers an hour, and it's sometimes too fast and sometimes too slow. So A is a measure of badness. And similarly, g tells me how much gas I used. And it's also a measure of badness because I don't want that to happen either. So O is bad, O is high, when you are away from the set point and when using too much gas, all right? So obviously we can now say that what we want to do is to minimize O, right? So our goal, okay, subject to, subject to what? Zero is less than or equal to X is then equal to max. Okay, so let's just look at that for a minute. What's going on over here? What we did was to start right over here. You know, we have a physical system. We have a car, we have an engine, we have accelerator, wind, and all this other stuff, right? So somebody says, you know, optimize this for me. You know, <laughs> some car manufacturer presumably says that. And what we did was you kind of looked at it and we said, okay, what can we control, okay? What are the fixed parameters? Well, the fixed parameters, we can define what the fixed parameters are. Perhaps the vehicle itself is a fixed parameter. What can we control? And we say, okay, the only thing you're allowed to do is to change the position of the accelerator. So we'll give that a variable, you know, x. So we already got started over there. And we said, okay, there's a feasibility constraint. I have something over here, right? The next thing we said was, okay, how can the thing change on us? Well, the input variables, wind is the only variable, perhaps the other variables as well. Maybe you can use regular petrol, you can use you know, a super high something or some, some other additive, I don't know. So those are also other input variables. But for the purpose of a particular problem instance, those input variables look just like fixed parameters. You really can't control them. You know, for one particular problem instance, we don't need to worry about that. Then we say, what are the outputs? Again the person giving you the problem says, look, I really want you to make sure you obey the set point, you don't use too much gas. So immediately I get two more variables out of that, A and G, in a fairly normal fashion. And then I say, okay, I want to combine these two, and I put in a parameter alpha, tuning parameter, it tells me how much I prefer gas to uh, being at the set point, okay? If I say, look, you can use as much gas as you want, I don't really care, we'll just set alpha to zero, and then all you do is over here, but then we can play around with that little you know, it's a tuning parameter that's alpha. And we allow this, we allow us, uh, this allows us to define the, the objective function O very, very, very straightforward fashion. And then we say, let's optimize, it. Let's, let's find this. This goal over here is optimization. This goal basically says, I'm now going to find <coughs> some way of controlling X such that O is minimized, okay? And now we can start thinking about how do we do it and so on and so forth, but at least now you're in the right frame of mind to appreciate what optimization is all about. Okay, it's about modeling and then finding the objective function and maximizing or minimizing O subject to the control parameters and everything else is fixed. The fixed parameters, input parameters are all fixed. And then, you know, of course, we have the transfer function that's also given to us. Yes, sorry, what's your name? Uh, my name is Hani. Hani, okay. Classical definition for linear system does not include the input. 
is the relationship between input and output in terms of Laplace transform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's it's y over the input, yes, output yes. over the input, yes, yes, and, yes. The, and the function is only defined for yeah. linear system. Yes. It does not include the input, as yeah. you have mentioned here. Does that include the control input, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So I am using the transfer function loosely over here. It is, when you do control theory, we'll go into the actual notion of transfer quite precisely and in the you know, for, uh, tra transform domain, etc. Oh gosh, <laughs> okay. This is not something I expected. Okay, all right. Let me just uh, kill this with maximum efficiency by removing the battery, okay. This always seems to work somehow. <laughs> so um, the, the transfer function is uh, meant to be reminiscent of that. When we do optimization, we actually don't have a control input. Okay, we actually uh, are not doing control per se, but I'm trying to use the same exact model for control theory and for optimization. That's why I'm putting this over here. In fact, what we'll end up very quickly seeing is that we only focus on f, which is some some uh, some function of the inputs going to some objective function. I'll actually do that step in just a minute, but I just want to get the modeling out of the way. We use the same exact modeling for control theory as well, by the way. That's why I want to keep one single modeling for both of them. But uh, uh, so this is not exactly capital H that you would see, you know, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the classical control, but it's, it's roughly in that same, it's in the same spirit. Yeah. Another question in the back, I thought. Okay, Any, anything else? All right, so, so what we're doing over here really is to start putting some mathematical bones into a practical system. That's the real takeaway message, okay? So you go into some, some system, how do, you, how do you start doing it? You know, I'm trying to give you the mindset you have to use to do the modeling, because this is the part which is actually quite tricky, okay? What is the input, what are the control? Those are the things that become tricky, okay? Um, all right, I'm going to uh, do one step further, as I mentioned to Hani, and then I will then go back and do a second example just to you know, give you a better idea of what's going on. So the, second, the step I want to go through with you further so so let's say that oh some func some function g of some output parameters, right? That's that's what I said. Oh some function g, and we said that the output is some function f of the input and control. Okay, so obviously what I can do is to just combine the two and just say oh some function h of the input and control. And actually I should probably say over here the fixed as well, just to be. Okay, all right. Now these guys are constants. This is constant and this is constant from the perspective of a particular problem instance that we're trying to optimize. So we could just kind of lump them all into some constants, and we can just write this as basically h or some constants and control. Okay? It's nothing, I'm not doing anything, you know, particularly clever over here. It's just rewriting terms. And therefore, we get the, we get the, kind of classic optimization problem optimization can then be defined as choose the uh, uh, control uh, parameters subject right to feasibility To, and we'll call optimize, optimize just a shorthand for minimize or maximize, right? To optimize uh, 
Okay? That's it in a nutshell. If you have one sentence definition, so choose the control parameters, subject to feasibility, to optimize an objective function O. Okay? And that sort of is, is, is the whole thing. Okay? So once you do the modeling, you got what you mean by control parameter, you kind of know what the feasibility constraints are, and then to optimize it with respect, op optimize the objective function, we need to know the transfer function, and that's what we do you know, by modeling the system mathematically. If I change the inputs, how do the outputs change? Okay, that's the transfer function. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, uh, let me do one more example just to kind of set these things in a bit more perspective. And this is the example that's in the in the book, and it's unlike the previous uh, example, which was I just made up. Yeah. Regarding the fixed parameters, yes. You mentioned never certain about the fixed parameters as well. What do you mean you're never certain? I, I mean we never know the exact, right, the triangle. Yeah, 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 yes. We are never sure about the, the fixed, fixed parameters. Yes, yes, there yes. There are some variations. Yes. And we should consider robustness. Yes, yes, yes. Uncertainty. Yes. Do we consider such things here? Uh, not in this class. But, uh, I mean, once you enter into the mathematical world, so you have the real system, right? Mm -hmm. Then the modeling translates the model into the mathematical world. Once you're in the mathematical world, constants are constants and variables are variables. Okay, nothing changes roles. If you want to model the, if you want the mathematical model to include uh, what you think of as constants as variables, that's okay. For example, just to give you an example of this, let's say that the engine has got a capacity of whatever 2.4 cube, you know, liters. That's you think is a constant. Now, one modeling is engine capacity 2.4 liters, and that's it, right? Another model is. Engine capacity is a Gaussian distributed random variable with a mean of 2.4 and a standard deviation of 0.1 cubic liters, for example, right? Now I have this random variable, and we'll discuss that in a later, that actually says it's not a constant anymore, it's actually a random variable. It went from constant to a variable. That now says, okay, you know, we cannot manufacture exa uh, uh, engines exactly. However, we can statistically sample them and come up with a distribution that fits this. Right? So then in the, we've imported the randomness into the mathematical model. Right? That makes it more complex right? because now I can't just say divide by x. I can just do expected values. I can look at sort of you know, uh, expected computations rather than actual computations. See what I mean? So it's a question of what do you import? How much complexity do you import into your model? The more complexity you import, the more realistic it is, but also it becomes more harder to solve. So we have to make this fine balance between complexity and realism. And that's why it makes it hard. And when we import those probability concepts into our optimization, can we still solve it? Uh, yes, but it becomes much, much harder. For example, you know, we can't do linear systems anymore. Yeah. Right? But so. Yes, you, well, it depends. It depends. Uh, stochastic optimization is something that people don't really understand very well. Okay. As uh, so I found out, I thought it was easy, but it's not. So for now, we'll just ignore it. We'll import only the basic stuff. Remember, you're not going to learn French here. If you want to know stochastic optimization, you do a C and O grad class and then come here, okay? Or come here and then go there, okay? Right. Any other questions about this? Okay, let's do a simple numerical example and then we'll take a break. All right, so what do you want to do? I want to optimize a very, very, very simple system. And you know, so I want to kind of tell you the system and hopefully I'll ask you for you know, questions about how it works. Here's what I have. I have a link. The link carries 100 packets a second. Okay? And if I send more than 100 packets a second, the excess gets dropped because there's no much capacity. All right? And what do I control? I can control how many packets per second I send into it. And what do I want to do? I want to make sure I don't I, I, know I don't drop too many packets and I carry as much as I possibly can. So this is a question that, you know, presumably somebody could ask you, do it. So, well, let's try and, let's try and model it. So here's, I told you in words what it is. So what are the fixed parameters of the system? You know, what is it that I know about the system? Any, anybody who's, yeah? Uh, bandwidth. Uh, the bandwidth, okay. So fixed parameter is basically it's 100 packets per second. So at least Earl read the book. Okay, but it's also obvious, you know, there's only number I gave you is 100 packets a second. It's fixed, you can't change it, you know, it's given to you, whatever it is. Now, as you point out, maybe it's not 100, 
Maybe it's, you know, it's kind of variable and the on average is 100 packets a second. We'll ignore that. For now, it's 100 and that's all it is. What can we control? What's the control parameter? Anybody? Sorry? Number of packets sent. So my sending rate is what I can control. And I'll call that x just, just for that. What's the input parameters? What are the uncontrollable kind of inputs into the system? Yeah. Maybe the arrival process. The arrival process. No. My arrival process is my sending rate. I can control that precisely. Remember, I have a link. I'm just telling you how many packets can I send. Okay. So. No, it, it cannot be the same. Maybe the arrival process rate exceeds the. You're, 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 you're. You are thinking too far ahead. I have a very, very dumb problem. Asking you 1 plus 1 equals 2, and you're saying, you know, in the complex plane, I can do this. Okay, no, we're just doing integers. <laughs> Forget about arrival process. I have a link. Here, there's a link. I have some rate. I can send into it x. And this has a capacity of 100 packets per second, whatever that means. Assuming fixed size packets, I guess. What's the input to the system? What are the input variables? The uncontrollable input, like the equivalent of the wind? Yes. There are none. That's right. The inputs is, we know everything. There's nothing extra in the system. It's just trivial. Okay, that's why I'm saying don't worry about arrival process. There's no input variables that we don't know about. There's only one input, and that's us, nobody else. Now, if you had cross traffic, right, who is trying to also simultaneously send stuff in, Okay, now that would be an input. Okay, because now you're sharing the link, but we're not even doing that. This is just too dumb. Yeah. Your packet loss on the link. There's no packet loss on the link. If you had that, yes, that would be equivalent of sharing the link with a loss process, which is coming in, right? It's exactly the same as a loss. It doesn't, you can model it that way. What's the transfer function? Oh, sorry, what are the output process? What are the output parameters? Okay, the two output parameters, I'll give you a hint. And you can't answer well because you read any somebody who hasn't read, read the material. What are the outputs over here of the system? So let's go back over here. I have some sending rate, and if I send more than hundred, it gets dropped. Okay. So what are the two output? What are the two output variables? Yes, Cameron. Uh, uh, yeah, throughput. That's right. So throughput. What do you actually carry? And then the loss rate. Right? So, for example, if I send it 70 packets per second, my throughput is 70 and my loss rate is 0. If I send it 200 packets per second, my throughput is 100 and my loss rate is 100. Yeah? But is loss rate an independent variable? No, it's not. I never so said why, it was. Why do we then define an extra variable which doesn't have an extra meaning in it? It has a meaning in it. If I send it 70 packets per second and the capacity is 100, the loss rate is? Zero. And if I send it 70, if I send it 200 packets per second, what's the loss rate? 100. What's the throughput? Well, if I send it 500 packets per second, what's the loss rate? Okay, and the throughput is 100. These are two separate things. Why, are they, why does it have no extra value? It can be inferred from the. That's a transfer function. Right? Output is an output. Outputs are inferred from the inputs using the transfer function. Just because they can be inferred doesn't mean they are not output variables. By increasing the number of outputs, you are making the system more complex. That's fine. That, that's my prerogative. I can make it as complex as I want. In fact, it's a very simple system. But, but the, the point I want to raise is that the two outputs are, in fact, independent. You cannot predict the one output from the other. There's no correlation between the two output variables. There is a correlation between the input and the fixed parameters and the output, and that is a transfer function, which is what you expect. But there's no correlation among the output variables. Okay, and that's that's important to know. So the output variables are in fact orthogonal in this case. It's not always the case. You can have correlated output variables. We're not studying that over here. But, but for modeling a simple system, yes. it's better to have the, the less amount of. You need variables. both of these. You need both. You need both of these, actually. Just hold your question for a second because you'll see why you need both. Okay, let's come to the transfer function. Okay, so what's the transfer function for throughput? Okay, let's say throughput is, how do you define the throughput in terms of the sending rate and the fixed variable? What is it? Throughput equals 
Yeah. So it's basically nothing more than the min of x and 100, right? And the uh, loss rate, so what's the loss rate in terms of the input variables and the, uh, and the fixed parameters? What is it? Sorry? Anybody want to? Yes, in the back? Haniket? Yeah. So it, it, the, the loss rate is the uh, larger of 0 and uh, x, sorry, 100 minus, uh, x minus 100. Okay, so if you send it less than 100, you get 0. If you send it more than 100, it's this, right? So now we are in a position to define the objective function. So right now the objective function is undefined, okay? I just said, you know, I don't want to lose too much and I don't want to, uh, I want to carry as much as possible. So now I'm going to make that more, I have to make that more precise. So one possible objective function is just O equals nothing more than uh, throughput minus the loss rate. Okay, for example, you know, so O increases as your throughput increases, O goes down as your loss rate increases. So this is a simple linear thing over here is all we need to do. And if you do this, then we just expand this out to be uh, uh, just the uh, min, min of x 100 minus max of 0 x minus 100. So that's my objective function expressed in terms of x. And now you see why I need both variables, because I have to have the objective function that if you don't have loss rate as output variable, the objective function cannot have that as a, as a value to be optimized. Right? I want to minimize the loss rate. And I'll just show you the graph. It's much easier to optimize it using just the graph. So on the x-axis is x, and on the y-axis is O. And we see quite naturally, this is, takes a little bit of thought, not much, that at 0, we're going to have a throughput of 0 and a loss rate of 0, so my objective function is 0. At 100, I have a throughput of 100 and a loss rate of 0, so I kind of go up linearly. And at 200, I go down to 0 again. And after that, it kind of goes negative on me because this is capped at a capped at 100. It's never going to be more than 100. And this can be, you know, much, it can get you know, basically larger and larger all the time. So the optimal, optimal point is clearly this one over here, I should send at 100. And intuitively, of course, this is just obvious. If I have a link which has 100, the best rate to send it is 100. You know, there's no point sending any faster than that. So intuition and the math kind of match up. And you see this nice, straightforward picture over here. Okay. Any questions about this so far? Yeah. So when you said there's no correlation between throughput and loss rate, right. what is that? Because in this example, it seems there is a correlation. Uh, not exactly. If I tell you the throughput is uh, 50. Uh, loss rate is zero. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Uh, given the fixed parameter and the throughput, yes, you can do that. Yeah. If I didn't, if you didn't know the fixed parameter, then you don't know. Yeah. Yes. In this case, yes. But it's because it's a really trivial system. But in general, you don't really know. Yeah. You're right. Okay. That's, I should be more careful about that. Yeah. Any other questions about this? I managed to send two people to sleep. I won't tell you who your names are, so it's time for a break. And after the break, I'll kind of continue with the system of two variables. But basically, I've gone through the modeling, a couple of, and definition, and then we'll start with the system of two variables in about a few minutes from now. Okay. All right. Okay. Can I raise this stuff, everybody? Okay.
Oh, jeez. Okay. Well, you'll be happy to know I finished page one and page two. So, <laughs> page two and a half. <laughs> okay. Still, for the first day, it's not a bad, uh, it's not a bad start. Okay. Uh, so, how many of you have studied optimization already in an undergrad class? One. Okay. These are all the dangerous people here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So this is going to be not as deep as what you studied. Hopefully, there's more more intuition and more emphasis on the things that are not covered in the textbook, things like modeling and uh, um, you know how do you actually create the mathematical structure in the first place. So that's a trade-off. Unfortunately, you know it's it's, it's there's no there's no there's only guidelines. But there's no actual rules for that. Okay. Uh, Anything else? Any other questions about the course or? Okay. All right. We have a few early exits. That's good. <laughs> I, I like to have grad course about 16 people. So half of you are, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I expect this course to be a bit larger than uh, than, than than normal. Uh, I really feel that you know the the students coming into grad programs don't have enough math. They kind of come in, and you know they they they've not learned all these different things. And then you're at a big disadvantage when you try to write papers because you have you have no idea what what actually to uh, to do. Actually, I should ask one more question. Just so, for, how many people are kind of new students who just started this term over here? Okay, one, two, okay, not too many. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So next time I'll bring my juggling balls. I promise my students I'll show them how to juggle. So, <laughs> so the only thing I can do in the break to wake up people. <laughs> I used to fall asleep in class all the time. It was terrible. I could never stay awake, especially after lunch class. And I had the one of the worst experiences in my life was I was interviewing at a university, and the person is interviewing me. Ha I have us in a seminar class. I had a seminar class. I was in my fifth year at that time, so I didn't really need to take the class. But for some reason, I'd convinced myself I wanted to learn bad little compiler architecture or something like that. I don't know what it was, something obscure. And there were only seven people in the class. We sat on the table immediately after lunch. And after 15 minutes, I couldn't stay awake. I know seven people were on the table. <laughs> you can see who's sleeping. And he was interviewing me <laughs> for a job. <laughs> It was terrible. I, you know, I hoped he didn't remember me or remember my name. I said, I, you know, I, I didn't want to interview with him, but he was there, and I didn't get the job because he probably said, "That guy, he slept in every single seminar course, every every single class." It is true. I slept in every single class. <laughs> so, my sympathies are with you as a student, but you know, it's still not a good thing to do in class to sleep. So I try to keep you awake. Uh, on the other hand, he was a really boring lecturer, so you know, a very boring speaker, very very boring in every respect. So I had good reason to fall asleep, but oh boy, it's terrible. You walk into this room and you see this guy who mostly you've seen through the sleep-induced haze, like oh, this is guy. <laughs> all right. Now that we're all refreshed, let's start a something which is a little bit more fun. And I'm going to actually pretty much follow what I have over here so that I don't go wrong, can go wrong easily. So what I did over here with this, with this packet, packet on a link business was to optimize a simple system with just one variable, which was the number of packages sent x. So OK, it's kind of simple and easy. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop all pretense that this is not math. I'm going to go straight into a very abstract system of, you know, uh, of variables, we just ignore the physical system altogether. I'm going to just throw the equations. Let's not worry about where it comes from, okay? And we'll focus on just how do we optimize it because you're going to have two variables, and then we'll get even more uh, kind of uh, interesting. We'll do three variables, and then you know, go into hundred thousand variables. So you do one, two, three, and then hundred thousand. So that's the way it goes. All right. So let's do two. So here's the system. I'm going to define a system O, which is uh, two x1 minus x2. So again, just to make sure you're understanding this over here, x1 and x2 are my control parameters. So I have a system with two knobs, x1 knob and x2 knob. And the output is a nice, simple linear function. It's 2x1 minus x2. And I have the feasibility constraint, which says 
x1 is greater than or equal to 0, x2 is greater than or equal to 0, and the joker in the pack x1 plus x2 equals 1. Okay? So I, I, don't, I, I don't know why it's like that, but that's what it is. So <clears throat> somehow we have a system where, you know, the two input parameters must add up to 1, okay? And that's how we define the feasibility. Now what we want to do is to choose the value of x1 and x2 such that O is maximized because you want to do a maximization rather than minimization. So you want to do maximize O where O is this such that these are the constraints. So we have the constraints on the control variables. We have the transfer function written out over here. O in terms of the control variables, the, con the uh, fixed parameter is 2 and the minus 1, and we want to maximize O. That's the, that's the mathematical model. So what are you going to do? I'm going to actually show how to do it geometrically because it's kind of easy to see it that way. So let's just draw this over here. So on the x-axis, we'll have x1. That's all possible values of x1. On the y-axis, I have x2, all possible values of x2, all right? And what we're going to do is we're going to plot on this uh, basically uh, the, the allowed values of x1 and x2, all right? So for the first of all, this one says x1 greater than or equal to 0 says that we're in the right half plane over here. So our, our solution, x1, x2, which is some point in this plane, lies over here. And similarly, it lies above there, right, because those are the two parameters. So we can get rid of these two things easily is simply saying the solution lies in this quadrant, okay, of the plane. That's all we know for now. And then we have this one, x1 plus x2 equals 1. That's easy also. We just draw a straight line, and this is basically 1, 0, and this is 0, 1. We draw a line from 1, 0 to 0, 1, and now we know one more thing, which is that not only do we know that x1 plus x2 equals 1 means in this quadrant, we also need to only consider points on this segment between 1, 0, and 0, 1, okay? So, so that's, now what we need to do is to find out where on this segment are we going to find the value, uh, where on the segment is O maximized, okay? So how do we do that? Again, it's pretty straightforward. Let's just start at some random point. Let's just pick a point, okay? Let's say I pick a point over here, all right? The value of x1 is 0, the value of x2 is 1, so what's the value of O, which is 2x1 minus x2? It's minus 1, so O equals, all right, okay? So what do we do? We kind of, let's say we go down over here uh, to some point over here in the middle, okay? And let's just pick some values over here. Let's say this is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, we know that's on this line because 0.5 plus 0.5 equals 1, and that's the constraint function, so we know that 0.5, 0.5 is over here. So what's the value of x o over here? Okay, o over here is 0.5, because it's 2 times uh, 1, sorry, uh, 1 minus 0.5 is 0.5, and then let's just go down over here. What's the value of o over here? Well, I'll just give it to you. It's basically it's 2 because y is 0. So, <clears throat> What we're seeing over here is the following phenomenon. That is, that we know that all the solutions lie on this line, okay? They all lie on this line, all right? And we can choose some point on this line, and if we move in this direction in the solution space, we find that O increases, okay? In fact, it's very easy to see from the structure of O that O monotonically increases, all right, along this line. As you go, Further down this line, if you go epsilon, O gets better by, uh, I guess in this case, uh, the three epsilon, right? You get two from here and one from here because of some. So you keep going over here until you come over here. At this corner point, at this extremal point of the range, we find the maximum value of O, which is two. Okay, so see what's going on. We find a point. This is a feasible point. This is also a feasible point. These are all feasible points. Okay, we have an infinity of feasible points over here. What is going on is that I find a feasible point, and then I kind of look at a neighbor of the feasible point, and I say, am I better or am I worse? 
If it's better, fine, let me go there. So I go down an epsilon step, and then I keep going down. I say, hey, you know what? This direction looks pretty good to me. If I keep going in this direction, O keeps getting better and better. At some point, I run out of steam. I have no more place to go. I stop over here, and I say, okay. I run out, and this point, which is a corner point, because at this point, essentially, if I go beyond this point, I'm going to go into negative X2 territory, which is, not, which is prohibited. I find the optimum value of O to be 2, okay? So what's going on here? What are the steps? You know, let's kind of understand the steps. What we do is first, in the geometrical sense, we are depicting the solution space. So the axes are x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on, all the different axes, okay? So each point in this space is a possible solution, okay? It's a possible setting of control variables, all right? Each point is a valid, each point is a possible setting, all right? Now, some of these are prohibited. Why are these prohibited? Because the constraints say so, okay? Anything that's in the lower half and the left is, is gone by these constraints. So now what you're doing is you're taking that space and sort of shrinking it down, okay? You're now shrinking it down to a smaller space. And then what you're finding based on these constraints is that portion of the space which is feasible, okay? This is the feasible. So in our case, the feasibility set, feasibility set defined by the constraint is just a straight line, okay? Then we start at one point over here, just essentially some random point, and we look at the potential. We can look at uh, how uh, should we move to make O bigger, in this, because you're maximizing, and we find it says go along the line, and we keep going until we stop. And when we stop, we find the optimal point, which is one zero. And again, visually, by inspection, you can see right away that, yeah, obviously, O is maximized when X2 is zero because that maximum is X1, but you can also see that over here, all right? So the steps that I've shown actually generalize to more than one dimension, more than two dimensions, okay? That's why I wanted to go through it in a little bit more abstract. Uh, and I'm going to now do a solution with three to show you how that works in three dimensions. But in two dimensions, it should be clear what's going on. Okay, so before I do that, are there any questions about this over here? Okay, straightforward. Okay, so already you can see how sort of my optimization uh, kind of works. So let me now move to the three dimension case, uh, three variable case, and we have some more interesting structure over here. I'll leave that up just so you can keep it, and I'm going to move on to a different system. So it's a very similar system. We say that O is three x one minus x2 minus x3, and similarly, x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 1, and x1, x2, x3, greater than equal to 0. Okay, and you want to maximize, maximize O defined in this way. All right, it's a very, very simple uh, generalization of the previous, of the previous system. And okay, so now let's try drawing this. So I'll draw that in this fashion. So let me make sure I'm drawing it in the right way. Um, so we have x3 up on top. And then I have, uh, oh, wait a minute. I'm drawing, I drew. Okay. Let me just draw it the same way so I'm not going to mess it up. Okay, so again, what we're going to do is define a space where the axes are the control variables, x1, x2, x3. So that's what I did over here, very similar to this over here. And now what I want to do is to start figuring out the shape of the space where the solution must lie. Well, these three constraints immediately say that my solution lies in the positive octant, right? The one-eighth of the space where all these values are positive. So this is defining the octant, so it lies over here. We can ignore the remaining seven out of eight, seven eighths of the space as being not very interesting. Now this one over here, x1 plus x2 plus s3 equals one, just as this defined a line, x1, x2, x1 plus x2 equals one defines a line, x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals one defines a plane. And what are the corners of the plane? Again, that's pretty easy to see. It looks something like this.
try doing that in PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. And this value is 1, 0, 0. This one is 0, 1, 0. And this one is 0, 0, 1. All right, so I have these three points. Again, because the relationship is linear, we know right away that the edges are lines. We can just draw the lines between the corner points. And we kind of have this over here, right? So we know what? We know that the solution lies somewhere in this shaded plane. Okay? We don't know exactly where it is, but it's somewhere there. Okay? Now, intuitively, as we saw earlier, we're going to expect it to lie at one of the corners. Okay? But we'll prove that in just a second. So <clears throat> how do we start optimizing the system over here? Okay, let's just kind of pick a random point. Let's say I pick this point over here, just like I did over there. So what's the value of O over here? Well, it's 0, 0, 1, and O is this. So the value of, of O over here is what? Sorry? Minus 1, right? Okay, it's minus 1. And what about the value over here on that corner point? O over here is also going to be minus 1, same thing, okay? So over here, O was minus 1 at exactly one point. Even if you moved epsilon away from it, O was not going to change, it was going to change, right? Here what we find is that O actually is, is the same on this entire line over here. This entire line over here always has the value minus 1, and why is that? It's because in this line over here, X1 is 0. X1 is 0 because we're on that plane over here, the X1, X2, X3 plane, so X1 is guaranteed to be 0. And X1 is 0, this just becomes X2 plus X3 equals 1, right? The constraint X2 plus X3. So this line is X2 plus X3 equals 1. If X2 plus X3 equals 1, then the, op the function this plus this equals 1, okay? So you just get minus this plus this is just going to be minus 1 because it's going to be minus 1 in the whole thing, right? Because x2 plus x3, so O can be written as 3x1 minus x2 plus x3. And this is going to be 0 minus 1, right? Because x2 plus x3 equals 1. And so we get that O equals minus 1 on the whole line. Just simple math, right? Everybody with me so far? Okay, because of the constraint equation, this combined with this tells me that O is minus 1 on that whole line, no matter where I am. Okay, it's a bit, uh, you, you should probably go and revise that once more when you go home because it's, it, it's easy when I talk to you about it, but you know, you have to really figure it out. Anyway, this is called an isoquant. And iso means same, quant means quantity, it means the quantity in this case O is the same along the whole line. It's an isoquant, okay? So what we've done is we've taken the solution space and we found one isoquant. This is the isoquant minus one. Along this entire line, O stays minus one. Now what we're gonna do is this. We're gonna move epsilon in the direction of X1. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the value over here, epsilon on X1, all right? I'm going to erect a plane like this which is epsilon away, parallel to the x2, x3 plane. I'm going to find the intersection of this plane, this plane over here with that plane over there, which is sort of this line like this. And I'm running out of colors over here, so that will have to do for now. Next time I'll bring colored chalk, okay? But this line that I've drawn over here is an epsilon away from the x2, x3 plane and represent the intersection of the epsilon uh, of the plane x1 equals epsilon with the constraint plane x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 1. All right? So far, so good? Okay. Now, what can we say about the value of O over here? Okay? What can we say about the value of O over here? Well, let's think about it. We know that this is going to have, the O is going to have value of 3 epsilon minus x2 plus x3, right? Now x2 plus x3 plus x1 equals 1, x1 is epsilon, so x2 plus x3 equals 1 minus epsilon, right? That's what we have. 
just from this over here. And if you plug that in over here, we get that O equals 3 epsilon minus 1 minus epsilon, okay, which is equal to uh, 4 epsilon minus 1, okay? Now, the value of O over there was minus 1, and the value of O over here is 4 epsilon minus 1, which is greater than minus 1, right? You see what's going on? What I've shown you using just a simple math over here is that if we move epsilon step away from the x2, x3 plane, and we look at the line on the constraint plane, we know that along the entire isoquant, along the entire isoquant, the value of O is 4 epsilon minus 1, and in fact, this value is greater than O equals minus 1. So we've actually gained something. We've jumped from one isoquant to the next isoquant, which is better, which is just what we wanted to do. We managed to find, we managed to find an isoquant, which is better. Imagine that you have a hill, right? You have some hill, and we have these contour lines. Okay, these are the levels which are exactly the same as isoquants. These are the contour lines. I'm over here at minus 1, and I find minus 1 plus 4 epsilon. And I say, hey, that's better. I'm going to go up. What you're doing is sort of climbing a hill 4 epsilon at a time. Okay. Now, I don't recommend you do this in real life. You, know, you probably want to take delta steps rather than epsilon steps. But no matter. In this case, by going on epsilon steps over here, what we're doing is we're kind of moving this epsilon plane further and further along the x1 axis, we're going to find better and better values of O, okay? And they're all isoquants. We don't need to look. If you look, find even one point, we know that they're all the same because it's isoquant. And these isoquants are parallel to the x2, x3 plane. So we take this plane over here like this and pull it in the x1 direction. So I guess you pull it like this, okay? As we pull the plane like this, what's going to happen is O is going to get better and better and better, 4 epsilon at a time. If you pull it epsilon, it gets 4 epsilon better, until finally the plane departs. It, the, 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 this plane over here departs from the constraint plane at this point over here. And it departs this plane over here, we find that O equals 3. Again, what we reach is an extremal point of the constraint space. And at that extremal point, as we pull this isoquant plane away from this value over here, we exit with the optimal value, okay? And that gives you the optimal value of x, uh, of O in this case of being 3, at the point 1, 0, 0. Again, by visual inspection, it's clear that that is, the, that is indeed the optimal point. You can't get any better than that. And so we found the optimal point over here, okay? So let me just recap and then I'll pause for questions. What we did was we found the solution space, x1, x2, x3, and essentially every point in this space corresponds to a possible setting of x1, x2, x3, right? They're all just possible settings. Then what we did was we said, okay, let's exclude big chunks of the space, the seven octants that don't fit this constraint over here, we threw them away. And then we got this octant, and we got this constraint that said, oh, right, everything less on this plane over here. Then we chose a point over here, and we computed the value of O, or something. We looked at another value over here, just to see what it is, and guess what? It's the same thing. Say, oh, great, I found an isoquant. Once you find the isoquant, a little bit of math shows that an epsilon step towards the x1 axis makes it possible for me to find a better isoquant at the 4 epsilon value. Okay, or one minus, minus one plus four epsilon value instead of the minus one value, and that tells me this is the direction I should pull. And once I start pulling, okay, I'm always going to get better and better because it's a linear system, all right? And when do I stop pulling? I stop pulling when I reach the point where I exit the constraint space. At this point, there's no more space left. I can't go any better, and I exit, okay? And so what I've shown intuitively over here, and I will not show this formally, that I've shown you intuitively over here is that if we consider this shape over here, this shape which is defined by this and this and this and this plane over here, the extremal value of O lies at one of the vertices. And in fact, one can show that as long as this set of equations is linear, okay, it's a linear system, 
the optimal value will always lie at one of the one of the vertices. Okay, and this is what's called a polytope. And we're saying that basically the 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 uh, extremal value of the objective function that is minimal or maximal value will lie at one of the vertices of the polytope. What we need to do is find the right vertex, okay? What we need to do actually is to find the isoquant sort of plane and then pull this plane through and then it leaves the polytope. It will it'll, it'll come out in one of two places. Either it will come out at a point, in which case that's the value, or it can come out parallel to one of the faces, in which case the entire isoquant, all values there are, are optimal. Okay, or it can come out at a line. Okay, it can be like this, and it can come out at a line. Then everything along that line, and so on, will be will be the same thing. Okay, so we can choose different objective functions, so it emerges at a point, or a line, or a plane. But of course, the intuition is the same. The po it's it's where the constraint, where the where the uh, isoquant plane kind of leaves the constrained polytope. Okay, the polytope is just an n-dimensional, in this case, a three-dimensional solid, and then it, it generalizes to n dimensions. Okay, let me stop here. Are there any questions about this? Any questions? Okay, uh, let me see, I wanna make sure I... Okay, so now I'm going to kind of uh, jump into, I'm gonna give you some intuition about uh, uh, N dimensions and then we'll probably stop and we'll continue linear programming next time. I think I have enough you pumped enough into your head already. So let me tell you what happens when you go into n dimensions. Good things happen and bad things happen. The bad thing that happens is you can't imagine it, okay? It's very, very hard to imagine. Okay, I have three constraints over here, okay? Okay, now I'm gonna make x1, x2, x3, x4, all right? I can't draw it, okay? I can't, I mean, it's already I'm drawing three dimensions in two. Drawing four dimensions in two is, it can be done, but it's, it's called a tesseract, but it's not fun to look at. And once you start looking at intersections of, of these planes, so here I have to draw the intersection, this line represented the intersection of this plane, x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals one with the plane x1, uh, sorry, x, uh, x1 equals zero, right? Those are the two planes, and that's this line over here, this intersection of these two planes. So when two planes intersect, they get a line. When two uh, three-dimensional things intersect, you can get a plane, but when four, two four-dimensional things intersect, you actually get a three-dimensional thing, <laughs> okay? So if you take a four cube, a four hypercube, and another four hypercube, and to intersect these two things, the intersection actually is a cube. And it gets worse when you take two five-dimensional bodies, intersect them, you get a four-dimensional body, okay? So, so it gets pretty messy to, to, to kind of think about these things. So while the geometric intuition serves us, okay, once I say this is a 20-dimensional polytope, actually it's not, it's not a three-dimensional like an icosahedron or something like that. It's this thing that you cannot imagine, and I cannot imagine. I spent a long time trying to imagine what a four-dimensional or a five-dimensional body looks like, and I can't. Four-dimensional, by the way, is easy to imagine. What you imagine is, say, uh, let's see, if you want to imagine a four-dimensional sphere, this is what it looks like. You, you look at a sphere that's very small, all right, and then what happens is it grows over time and then it becomes small again, all right? And the time width, if you will, is the same as the spatial width R. So you define time and space in such a way that you can say one second is one centimeter, one second is one meter. If you do that, then in, if you say one second is one meter, then the sphere could be of radius one meter. And in one second, it goes from zero to a full size one meter and then goes down to zero again. Okay, that's a four-dimensional sphere. So each slice, each time slice is a sphere, right? And the fourth dimension basically means the sphere is growing and shrinking. And it's shrinking and growing exactly at what? Because, you know, basically sine theta, okay? Because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's in space dimension also, it has the same spherical coordinates. So, so that's a four-dimensional sphere, okay? It's a sphere that grows and shrinks. Now, how it's a five-dimensional sphere? I don't know, it's kind of, it's five-dimensional sphere is such that, you know, well, I don't know, it kind of, it's a four-dimensional sphere when you intersect it with one point in time. So you have to think about this in space. You get the picture. So if you cannot sleep at night, imagine a five-dimensional sphere. <laughs> it's wonderful. It puts you to sleep right away. At least it put me to sleep right away. Okay, so I'm going to now try and give you some intuition of how do we do things in 
100,000 dimensions. I said one, you know, there's two dimensions, three dimensions, let's do 100,000 dimensions. So when you go to 100,000 dimensions, we can forget about geometry altogether. You know, we don't, we don't actually have anything. But what we'll do is this. Notice that each vertex over here corresponds to some assignation of the variables x1 equals 0, x2 equals 0, x3 equals 1. Right? So 100,000 dimensions, what we really have is collections of vertices. So we say here's a vertex, x1 equals this, x2 equals this, all the way up to x100,000 equals something, and that is a vertex of the polytope. All right? So we don't know what it looks like, but this is what, it, this is what one vertex is. We can then take each of these constraints okay, and say, is this particular point that it shows, is it satisfying the constraint or not? If it's not satisfying the constraint, it's not in the polytope, right? So you want to take this kind of this polytope and you want to find all the points on it, okay? Like for example, you found all the points in this plane, you shaded it, and the same you want to find this polytope, and you want to find the extremal points on the polytope. And those extremal points where, for example, x1 equals 0 immediately is an extremal point because we know it's greater than or equal to 0. If it's equal to 0, it must be some vertex, right? So if you have 100,000 variables, just by setting each one to 0, we immediately get some points, right? And, and so on. So what we end up doing really is to look at a system of equations where these equations over here, these equations over here, x1 plus x2, x3 equals 1, represent constraints on the structure of the polytope. And then what we want to do is we want to find some point on that polytope, and we want to look at the value of O over there. And then we want to find some neighboring points, okay, and some direction to go in. And you say, okay, if you go in this direction, looks like things are getting better. And then we'll move sort of in that point. And what we'll do is we move from point to point to point in this polytope. At the end of it, basically, we'll come out to that point, which uh, in the 100,000 dimension space represents pulling the isoquant hyperplane out of the polytope. So just like you put a rabbit out of a hat, you pull the isoquant hyperplane out of this hyperdimensional polytope, and the point where it exits, or the plane where it exits, uh, the hyperplane where it exits, is in fact the optimal point, okay? So, so geometry is good to give intuition. We'll do this over here. So next time what I'll do is I'll show you how to kind of go into linear systems, you know, when we just kind of abandon ma uh, geometry altogether, and how we can start optimizing systems of several hundred thousand variables using a simplex uh, approach. Okay, so I'll stop over here. Any questions about this? Okay, great. So it's a short class and we'll continue next time.